The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar today. Um, it's the ACNC's webinar on charity tax concessions and endorsement. And given that's the topic, of course, we've got a special guest from our colleagues at the ATO. Mel Knight is here to present all her expertise on things charity tax. Afternoon, Mel. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Matt. That's all right, always a pleasure. Um, before we do get into it, um, just a few pieces of admin we want to run through. You can ask questions throughout the webinar using the navigation panel um, on the side there. We've got a couple of colleagues, Chris and Sarah, who are ready to answer all your questions there in the chat throughout the webinar. We will try our best to get to every question, but there are quite a few attendees here today. So if we don't get around to your question, we will endeavor to do so later on via email. Also, if possible, can you keep the questions to a more general nature? If, if they get too specific, it may be too difficult to answer in this format, and it may be best to give either the ACNC for charity-related matters or the ATO for more tax-heavy matters a call to go through the specifics of your organisation's issues. And we will give out the numbers um, throughout the webinar to, to help you with that. Also, if you're having some audio troubles, you may want to dial into the webinar on the confirmation email you would have received upon registering. There are some details there to do this. There's a phone number and then a code to put in, and you can. Um, that's one way to fix any audio troubles you may be having. And finally, at the end, we have a very short feedback survey. It consists of only three questions and takes probably no more than 20 seconds to complete, if that. So if you do um, have those 20 seconds, we greatly appreciate all the feedback we receive from the surveys at the end of the webinars. Um, that would be that would be wonderful if you could. Okay, with the admin out the way, let's get into the uh, presentation proper. Here's what we'll cover today. First, we're going to have a look at the basic uh, charity tax concessions, what they are and what they entail. We'll touch on how the ACNC, the ATO as agencies work together because they are, of course, we, we share some roles in this broader field, but of course there's specific roles for each agency. And sometimes it can be a little bit confusing to think about which one you have to go to for which issues and which applications. We'll look at um, deductible gift recipients and deductible gift recipient reforms. And we'll have a look at uh, specific topics of health promotion charities and public benevolent benevolent institutions. And following that, we will have a Q&A session at the end whereby we can answer some of the questions that are coming through during the webinar, the ones that we feel may have broader use for more attendees and we think would be um, worth covering for you all today. Okay, the first part today is having a look at um, charity tax concessions. So let's clarify at the beginning, the ACNC is the National Charity Regulator and does register organisations as charities. Now, where this touches on tax concessions is that charities must be registered with the ACNC, or organisations must be registered with the ACNC as charities to access Commonwealth charity tax concessions from the ATO. So the ACNC has a role in registering an organisation as a charity based on the information, based on the charity's um, activities and purposes. And then, it's up to the ATO um, to look at the charity tax concessions. Now, importantly, and we'll get into some of the details here, some tax concessions are only available for particular types of charities. So if you think about it as a bit of a two-step process, the ACNC has a look at the charity part, then the ATO endorses for tax concessions. Some of the tax concessions depend on the type of charity that your organisation can be registered as. Okay, I'll pass on to you, Mel, to just give an overview of the ATO's role in this, given that I've just explained how the ACNC, which is where I work, um, looks after the charity registration aspect of it. What's the ATO's broader role? So you've made a really important point there about um, charities and, and then needing to be endorsed by the ATO. So. Our role is administering tax concessions for charities. Um, and I think really importantly, the, you know, charities don't have to be registered with the ACNC, you know, if you've got a charitable purpose, 
but any organisation with a charitable purpose has to be registered with the ACNC and endorsed by the ATO to access those tax concessions. So you're not able to self-assess them. You have to kind of go through that registration and endorsement process. Um, so after the ACNC has decided on your charity registration, you probably you know would have noted that on your application form you can indicate whether you want to um, be endorsed by the ATO. The ACNC will then pass on your details to the ATO and will go through a process of assessing your applications. And so for most of those charity tax concessions, um, it's, a, it's an administrative process. Our um, staff will go through and make sure that you're entitled and then give you a, a ring to let you know that they've, they've been endorsed and you'll get a notification from us. Um, there are some special conditions for you know, particularly deductible gift recipient endorsement, and we'll, we'll get into that in detail, I think, a little bit later, Matt, um, that you may need to meet some other requirements. But basically, we work together with the ACNC to make it as seamless uh, for you as possible to, to kind of get that application through both agencies. Okay, oh, I forgot the third dot point that people can see on the screen now. Sorry about that. There may be <laughs> conditions for certain tax concessions. Yeah, and as Mel said, we'll get into some of that later. Um, there, there is a web address there on the screen, ABN, look up abr.business.gov.au. The relevance of that is that um, you can look up the ABN of an organisation and see if it is uh, endorsed for certain tax concessions. It doesn't, from memory, Mel, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't go into the specifics of every tax concession, but it does say that it is endorsed um, for charity tax concessions uh, as a sort of... That's thing. right. Yeah, so the ABN lookup, and I think it's, it's good too, if you're unsure about what tax concessions your organisation is already endorsed for, the ABN lookup is kind of the source of truth for that. So it will show you if you have income tax exemption, if you have any SBT, fringe benefits, tax concessions, um, GST concessions, and also if you've been endorsed as a DGR. The one bit of detail that it doesn't go into is the category that you might be endorsed for, unless of course you're um, an ancillary fund or a public benevolent institution. Okay, now just a brief overview of the working together. We have touched on a fair bit of this, so I think we can probably race through these points pretty quickly. Um, Mel did mention that organisations can apply for charity tax concessions when applying to register with the ACNC. So that means when you're filling in your application form to register the organisation as a charity with the ACNC and using the ACNC's form, there's a section in there to be able to um, apply for tax concessions too. It's just a way to make the process a little bit simpler in that you don't have to then go to the ATO once the charity stuff is done. Rather, we will pass on the information to the uh, tax office once we have decided whether the organisation is registrable as a charity. But Mel, the third dot point here, that's that's the general way things go and, and I suppose the easiest way, but there are cases whereby a charity may need to go to the ATO separately, right? Yeah, that's right. And we mostly see this if organisations, perhaps after they're established, they might want to apply for uh, a deductible gift recipient category you know, or if they're starting to do new work and they become eligible, um, they can come directly to us if they're already registered as a charity. And so we've got information on our website and the forms that are available and where to send them are there. Okay, now into some of the, the details of the charity tax concessions. We did mention that there are specific categories of DGR. And I know lots of people attending today are interested in the DGR stuff. But first, before we get to DGR, we will go over the, I suppose we'll call it the standard suite of charity tax concessions that are afforded to, uh, offered to organisations that are simply registered as a charity. Um, let's have a look sure. at them one by one. Mel, the first one, income tax exemption. Can you just give us an overview of, of what that is and, and I suppose practically what it means for an organisation? Yeah, so it is exactly what it says. It is an exemption from income tax and charities that have been endorsed by the ATO as income tax exempt do not need to pay income tax on their, um, their statutory or uh, like regular income that they receive. Um, and it also means that they have no obligation to lodge an income tax return with us. 
it's it's the big one. <laughs> right, right, yeah, of course, makes a massive difference. <laughs> um, yeah. The second one here, we'll get into some of the, um, I, I suppose, the, the more complicated aspects now. Goods and services tax concession. Um, can you again give us an overview of what that means and practically how to, how it works for a charity? Yeah, so I think there's a, a bit of misconception around this concept, this concession. So it doesn't mean that you are exempt from GST um, or that you don't have to collect or pay GST. What it is, is a, a suite of concessions, really depending on kind of what you do. So just, you know, a, a, some brief examples. The, the GST concession might mean that, you know, if you conduct like a raffle, um, there's no GST on, on those things. It also means that any gifts or donations that you receive, there's no GST on them. So it's about certain supplies that you make and, you know, perhaps concessional treatment for the way that you calculate GST. Another big one is um, income, it, sorry, input tax supplies for, you know, perhaps school tuck shops or uniform shops. Um, and then also the ability to treat fundraising events as input tax supplies. So it's quite complex. We have a lot of really good information on our website about the different parts of that concession. What it does mean though, you know, because it's not an exemption from GST, if your charity um, has a turnover of greater than 150,000, you're still required to register for GST. Yeah, important um, point, that one. Yeah, I think a lot of people might not have realised that. And of course, as we get into some of the more complex things here, it, it is worth reiterating that um, we may not be able to go into you know, the specifics of how it applies to your charity in the live chat with some of the questions. So if, if you do have some specific questions about how this applies to your organisation, it is worth giving the ATO not-for-profit line a call. And that that line, Mel, this is right, isn't it? That it goes straight to the team that deals with not-for-profit stuff, right? It's not the uh, I suppose the first step uh, in the tax call centre. Yeah, that's right. It's our it's our little team. We do all the endorsements for concessions and um, provide advice. So when you call that number, you're getting straight through to one of our not-for-profit team. Um, I don't have it on the screen now, but I may as well give it to you if you've got a pen there, everyone. It is one three hundred. 130248. It does show up later in the webinar, but I suppose it's worth jotting down now if you, if you want to give them a call. Let's move on to the next one, another one that could get a bit complicated. Uh, fringe benefits tax, and importantly at the end here, we've got two words, a rebate or an exemption. Once again, over to you, Mel. What, what is this and how does it apply to charity? How does it apply? So, and, and we are going to talk about um, public benevolent institutions and health promotion charities in detail um, in a couple more slides. But these are kind of the two levels of SBT um, concessions that are available. So the SBT rebate is available to um, all charities except for the public benevolent institutions and health promotion charities. And the rebate is essentially like a discount, I suppose is the easiest way to describe it, on the fringe benefits tax that your organisation would have to pay if you're providing fringe benefits to your employees. So it is, it's a discount. Whereas the exemption actually, if you're entitled to that, allows you to, to provide uh, like fringe benefits tax exempt benefits to employees up to a capped limit. Right. And just quickly, what are some of the benefits that commonly fall under this category? When you say benefits to employees, what, what might it entail? Uh, so a lot of employers, so, you know, not for profits that are employers, they might provide a salary package to their employees. Um, where they can, you know, forego part of their salary and maybe have a car or have part of their expenses paid. So, you know, it's it's part of the, you know, the, the salary package that they do. Right. So, you know, it might even come down to paying for school fees for, you know, your children or, you know, your mortgage repayment. Yeah, a whole sure. host of things can be salary package. There's really no limit on it. Yep, right. Last one here, um, uh, I'm going to listen carefully because the words don't mean much to me either, but a refund of franking credits. Can you give us an overview of what this means? And, and yeah, um, 
this is a really generous concession that's available to uh, registered charities that are endorsed as income tax exempt. And what it does, if you if your charity has um, investments um, like a, in shares and you receive frank dividends, it enables you to claim a refund of those um, franking credits on an annual basis. Yeah. So most people would do that through their tax return, but because you know, charities don't need to lodge a tax return, they're able to uh, claim these refund of franking credits. So it applies to charities that hold um, share investments. Right, right. Okay. And I suppose um, something that lots of people might not think about for their charity, some of the other concessions are a little bit more, I suppose, um, obvious or even stuff that pops up more, more readily. But uh, yeah, this is one that um, people may not have considered. Let's have a look at the big one now, the deductible gift recipients, because I know a lot of people here are interested in this topic. Firstly, deductible gift recipients are a, a, a special type of um, charity tax endorsement. And as it says on the screen, an, a charity endorses a deductible gift recipient can receive tax deductible donations, which means that if a donation, uh, if a donor um, gives some money, then that donor can claim back that donation on their personal taxable income when they lodge their tax return in the in the next or the next one that they lodge so it's a very uh, I suppose it's desired by lots of charities because obviously it can it can offer the um, offer the incentive to get donors to donate more money but it is limited in its scope it's not that an important point here not every charity is entitled to do this not every charity um, is automatically endorsed as a deductible gift recipient. It is a special category, and as the last dot point says here, the ATO has different categories of DGR, each with its own eligibility requirements. Mel, do you, do you know, I suppose off the top of your head, how many different categories there are? Because it, it, it ranges I, quite widely, doesn't I, it? Yes, I do, because I have to count them. <laughs> there, there are 50 different categories oh, Matt <laughs> and as you've kind of said that they all have their own individual requirements so like some examples are animal welfare charities and obviously we know public benevolent institutions is one category school building funds public libraries public museums so there's this whole uh, list of categories um, which we you know we have details for more but it's it's really important to note that you have to you know meet the specific requirements of you know the particular category for us to be able to endorse you. Yeah, and as it says on the screen, is and not all charities are eligible for endorsement as a DGR. And in fact, less than half of registered charities are endorsed as DGRs, which gives you an indication of the I, I suppose the different level from from your regular charity tax concessions, which requires just registration with the ACNC as a charity, this one is limited to a certain type of charity. Now, an important point here, again, it's worth reiterating, the DGR endorsement is decided by the ATO. So although there is um, a, a strong link between the two agencies, given the role the ACNC has in deciding charity uh, status or the type of charity that your organisation could be registered as, the DGR endorsement itself is still a matter for the ATO, right, Mel? Yeah, that's exactly right. And just on that, um, although um, although the AT, uh, sorry, the ACNC um, decides on the charity aspect of it, does the ATO also do its own look at the charity aspect, or is the DGR endorsement uh, does that take the ATO's uh, decision as as I suppose final on that charity type? Yeah, that's a really good question. And yes, so the ACNC, or the ATO, sorry, does take the ACNC's charity decision and, you know, your registered subtype as the final decision, you know, for charity purposes. And then we are just looking at um, what your organisation does and how you then fit into the, the DGR requirements for, for whatever category you're applying for. Okay. And ju just, um, one more question. This actually popped up in, in uh, a few things we've done on, on this topic. 
is the whole or part DGR concept. I think there was uh, there has been some confusion about that in the past. It, is that well, I suppose the simple question is that still um, uh, possible for a charity to be endorsed as a DGR in part, or does the charity have to be endorsed as a DGR as a whole? Um, so it depends on the category. Um, and a good example might be a school building fund that's operated by a religious organisation. So the religious organisation itself, there's no category for the advancement of religion, but they may be able to be endorsed in part for some of the activities that they do. So a religious organisation may be able to have a school building fund endorsement if they're operating a school, or they might have a necessity circumstance fund. So there's the, the opportunity with some of the categories for us to endorse you for part of the activities that you do. Right, okay. And of course, that does depend on the type of charity that your organisation is and, and, and what it does. And just finally, a fourth point here, DJ reform, measures before parliament. Uh, Mel, can you give us so, a bit of context for this one? Yeah, sure. So you may or may not be aware, there was a suite of um, DGR reforms that was announced back in 2017. And part of those reforms is actually progressing and is before the parliament at the moment. And that particular reform is one that requires all existing DGRs to be registered as charities. So the way we're waiting for that to kind of go through Parliament and hopefully we'll have some more information for people soon. If you're already registered as a charity and you're a DGR, it has no impact. It's only an impact for um, those existing non-government DGRs that are not already registered with the ACNC. Right, and yes, Mel's right, as, as this progresses, um, there will be more information coming from the ACNC, the ATO, and the um, relevant DGR registers too um, as as we move through these reforms, which brings us to um, the government DGR registers. So there are, you, you may be in an organisation that has DGR via one of these registers. There are uh, four uh, DGR registers that endorses uh, charities organisations based on what they do um, for DGR. Well, the ATO registers, oh, sorry, um, in, endorses the DGR. But the four government registers are the Register of Environmental Organisations, Cultural Organisations, Harm Prevention Charities and the Overseas Aid Gift Deduction. Uh, de oh, I've got a misprint there. Okay, we'll have to fix that up. Scheme. So the final thing here, Mel, one, one more that you might be able to give some context to everyone is the plans to harmonise these registers. Is that part of the DGR reforms you mentioned that were announced in 2017? It is part of those reforms, but as of yet, there's been no movement from the government to kind of progress them. Um, it's still, you know, on the on the books, so to speak. But if if charities are wanting to still apply for DGR under these categories, they should continue to do it, you know, with the established process that is kind of applying directly with the registers. And I guess these are the only four categories that the ATO, um, you know, doesn't administer. So the, the relevant government departments will look at an application and make a decision whether or not they're entered onto those registers and then it comes to the ATO for DGR endorsement. Right. And if you are Googling any of these, I would encourage you to type the word deduction accurately. I'm not sure how that A got in there, but deducation probably isn't going to show up in a Google search. Okay, on to the two special categories of charity, which are important because they come with their own DGR category. So if the ACNC registers an organisation as one of these two, then it is likely to be endorsed by the ATO uh, for a de deductible gift recipient. Health promotion charity, often referred to as an HPC or a public benevolent institution. So again, first the ATO, sorry, the ACNC decides on whether or not your organisation fits these categories and then um, will in, will give the registration as one of these uh, charity types before passing it on to the ATO to endorse the DGR. 
Um, before the ATO will endorse, so there are a couple of little checks that must be done, but it is important to note that the ACNC looks at the charity aspect of this, of course, and then the ATO looks at the, oops, sorry, looks at the tax part. Now, if we just go through some of the important aspects of both of these, because it is worth taking some time to clarify, and then I'll ask, I'll, Mel, I'll get you to explain um, what's required to properly be endorsed once you are um, considered one of these charities. But first, if we look at health promotion charity, it's important to note that a health promotion charity is a, a particular type of charity that um, has, has a special meaning, and it is an institution whose principal activity is to promote the prevention or the control of diseases in human beings. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, the point, though, is that it must, um, it, it probably requires more than just, say, a charity that could be registered with the purpose of generally advancing health. Health promotion charity, despite its name, um, does need to be an institution that with a principal activity of promoting the prevention or the control of diseases in human beings. So it's, it's a bit of a larger hurdle to jump than just simply advancing health. So for example, um, organisations that may promote general health and wellbeing are unlikely to be registered as a health promotion charity because there isn't that um, explicit focus on uh, prevention or control or treatment of diseases in human beings. So that, that's the thing to focus on here. If you're thinking your organisation may be eligible for this category, it really does need to be have a principal activity of that um, focus on a disease in human beings rather than just general health, promoting general health and wellbeing. The name is a little bit misleading because, as the name suggests, health promotion charity sounds like it is just generally promoting health. It is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of a higher bar than that. Um, a public benevolent institution similarly is a special category too. So this one um, is uh, an organisation that, again, is an institution with the benevolent relief as its main purpose. And importantly, that relief is provided to um, people in need, in recognisable need. So this goes into um, some more details on our website about you know, what does it mean to be benevolent, uh, provide benevolent relief? What does it mean to provide to people in need? It's worth having a look at that. And there's detailed fact sheets that we will send out in the follow-up email after this webinar that it's worth going through if you think either of these uh, charity categories apply to your organisation. If you are registered as one of these, the good news is your organisation is probably going to be endorsed as a deductible gift recipient. Now, what are the other, if there are any, special requirements for a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution to be endorsed as a DGR? And then if they are, what other uh, benefits do they get for that? These, these is two special categories, I think. So as you kind of said, there's a, quite a high bar that you need to pass with the ACNC. But as soon as you're registered under those charitable subtypes, you come to the ATO and you need to make sure you have a, a DGR winding up and revocation clause in your governing document, and then you'll be eligible for endorsement as a deductible gift recipient. So rather than the... ATO assessing your eligibility in a category, that assessment has already been done, the hard work by the ACNC, and it just comes to us to check off um, that you have the right clauses in your governing rules, and, and that's, that's it, basically. Um, so the benefits, I guess, of these two categories is they both, they provide you with the ability to receive tax deductible gifts, and also, um, for that quite lucrative um, fringe benefits tax exemption. So it basically means that you can provide um, exempt benefits to your employees up to a grossed up cap limit of $30,000 per year per employee. So it is quite a, you know, a, a good benefit. Yeah, right. 
And I've just sent a link to everyone there in the chat. So if you do have a look at your navigation panel there, that's that's the fact sheet for Health Promotion Charity. And I'll add the um, fact sheet for Public Benevolent Institution too. One thing that's worth pointing out now is on the screen here, the first stop point, that registered charities can apply to change their subtype. A subtype is the type of charity that you are registered as, your organisation's registered as, through the charity portal. Now, this means that if your organisation's already registered as a charity and it's not one of these categories, but you think it might be eligible, have a look through those fact sheets, see if it meets the eligibility criteria, and then you can apply to have it registered as one of these charities. And if in fact it does meet the criteria and it can be registered as a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution, um, then the same processes will apply. The, the info will be passed on to the ATO and a DGR endorsement following that, you know, all things being equal. So have a look through the fact sheets, uh, apply through the charity portal if you think that, that will um, be suitable for your organisation. Okay. Oops, sorry, there we go. We'll move on to the next one. Questions. We have, um, well, that, that's the presentation, or the formal presentation of the day. We've got quite a few questions that have come through, and we, a, a few that I think will be useful for um, everyone because there are some common themes that, are, that have popped up here. So we'll have a look at, uh, Mill, I think you're going to be in the hot seat for many of these given the nature of um, them with tax so we've had a few questions about the practicalities of issuing a tax receipt actually can you give us a quick overview of what does a tax receipt need to say what information does a charity need to put on a tax receipt um you know pr presuming uh, the charity does have dgr endorsement and they want to make sure that the donor can claim back that donation on their income tax yep sure so i guess at a really high level, the way the tax legislation works, there is actually no requirement, no legal requirement for you to issue um, a receipt for gifts that you receive, but it's kind of good practice and it actually helps your donor to substantiate their tax deduction. So if you do issue a receipt, there are some requirements that you have to meet and they are that you need to have the name of your organisation, um, you need to put your Australian business number and you need to include a note that the receipt is for a gift and obviously you'd have the amount, you know, that the gift is for. And what you can also include is obviously the amount that the money was, um, the amount of money that was donated or a description of the gift if it was property that you received and the date that it was given. Right, yeah, it's a good point. So it's, 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 good for, it's good for the donor to have that, of course, because if they're claiming back some stuff on their own income tax but can't substantiate it because the charity never issued a receipt, that's, that spells a bit of trouble. <laughs> yeah, but other things that donors can use, Matt, like, you know, if they've given you um, a donation and it's, you know, been from a bank transfer, the donor might, you know, have records of their, their you know, their bank records and things like that. So it's, it's not an absolute legal requirement for you to issue one, but it is a legal requirement if you choose to issue a receipt that you have, you know, the name of your organisation, your ABN, and some information that it is for a gift. Yep, right. A couple of questions again about GST. So I think um, it, it might be worth clarifying a few points here. So can a, can a DGR reclaim the GST it pays on certain things? Another question about whether charities should include GST. Um, so it might be worth clarifying how the GST concession works. Uh, yeah, sure. Foremost, it's not an exemption, is it? <laughs> No, it's not an exemption. So I think I'll just go back and reiterate that point that if your charity has a turnover of more than $150,000, you must be registered for GST. Um, and, you know, we've got a lot of information on our website about how you work out, you know, what's included in that turnover calculation. So I'd recommend kind of going and having a look at it. But basically, if, if your organisation is registered for GST, then you will need to charge GST on certain supplies that you make and you'll be able to claim back the GST that you have been charged to make those supplies. So that's kind of the key thing. If you're registered, you can claim GST, but you will also need to charge GST. Right. 
Right. Now, when we're looking then about charging GST, that's where these kind of GST concessions come in. And depending on the type of supplies that you might make, there may be some concessions to help you with the amount of GST that you actually need to charge on your supplies. Right. Yeah, and again, it's complex. It's, it's, yeah, it is complex. And if you are um, struggling to figure out how this applies specifically to your organisation, then um, please give the ATO's not-for-profit team a call. They will be able to help you out with the specifics of your organisation. That number again was one three hundred one three zero two four eight. Um, a few questions about managing funds here. Uh, do DGR funds need to be kept separate from other funds a charity receives? Can DGR funds only be used for specific things are some of the questions we've received. So maybe another complex one, Mel, but could you clarify any details about keeping DGR funds separate from other funds? Separate. Yeah, and so this is where, you know, how you asked me earlier about whether or not um, organisations are endorsed in part or as a whole, mm -hmm. that actually makes a big difference for how your funds need to be treated. So if, if your organisation is endorsed in part, sorry Matt, I'm getting a bit of feedback. I don't know whether you're getting that on your end. Are you? Okay. Um, um, okay. So if, if, if you're endorsed in part, then there's a requirement for tax and for DGRs that you actually maintain a gift fund that quarantines those gifts so that they're only used for a specific purpose. So if I go back to that example that I gave you about a religious organisation that might then be operating a school building fund, those DGR funds cannot be used for the advancement of religion at all. And they need to be quarantined in a gift fund that is only used for school building fund purposes. So it really depends on how your organisation is endorsed, as of, you know, how you would keep them. A lot of DGRs tend to keep those deductible gifts separate anyway, just for record keeping purposes. But if your organisation, say, is um, endorsed as a public benevolent institution, then there's no requirement to keep them the gifts separate from, you know, the rest of um, the organisation's funds um, and, and you can use those DGR funds for all of your purposes because you're endorsed as a whole. I right. hope that, that explains that it. Does make, yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense and, and I can see how the, the part endorsement and the whole endorsement really does make a difference with how the, the funds need yeah. to be managed. Yeah, so the key, the key thing is that you can only use your DGR funds for the purpose that you have been DGR endorsed for. Ah, right, good way of thinking about it. Um, let, uh, FBT keeps popping up in the questions as well. Um, a couple of, I, I suppose, more practical aspects of it. A question about eligibility for staff. So are all staff eligible for salary packaging and other benefits? Um, or is that only allowed with an exemption? It, do, does the rebate come into play here? Yes and no. So obviously if if you've been endorsed as SVT exempt, so for public benevolent institutions or um health promotion charities, um for for most of those most organizations that means that you know all of your employees are doing you know those work and it you know it even applies to kind of office and administrative staff the only time that that gets complicated i think is you know historically there are some organizations that are only endorsed in part for their pbi activities so it, it can't happen now with like new entities but it's like a historical thing um, those SBT exemptions, you know, do need to be quarantined to, you know, the PBI staff as such. And it's the same for um, public hospitals, like not-for-profit hospitals, that SBT exemption is obviously only available for staff um, that are directly involved in, you know, the, the provision of that hospital service. So there are some tricky little things. And I think if, if you need some further clarification about your particular circumstance, you would 
best your best bet is to give us a call at the ATO and we can kind of talk through that with you. If you're accessing or you're being endorsed for the FBT rebate, it basically, you know, it applies to all of your employees. But remember, it's not an exemption, it's merely a discount. So for a lot of um, organisations that do that are endorsed for FBT rebate, it's still going to cost you like there's still an FBT fringe benefits tax obligation for you so that's something that you'd need to weigh up as an obligation and a lot of organizations that do you know provide that rebate actually ask for contributions from their employees so it can become quite complex so it's something that financially your charity would need to you know weigh up whether you are going to provide those benefits to your staff. Great. Well, uh, one last question. Um, actually, we'll go two more. Um, a quick one here. Someone's asked what's the difference between DGR1 and DGR2 status and any particular requirement? Uh, good question. Always comes up. So DGR, DGR1 and 2, the main difference is DGR2s are ancillary funds. So public and private ancillary funds. It's, it's a special DGR category and they are funding um, trust only. So they don't do any activities except for pay money out to item one DGRs. And item one DGRs are basically all of your doing DGRs. So they're your public benevolent institutions, they're your animal welfare charities, your public libraries, all of the other categories that we have are item one DGRs. And the reason we've got those different is that the ancillary fund categories, private and public ancillary funds, can only give money to item one DGRs um, and they can't kind of give money to themselves, like between item two to item two. So that's that's really what that difference is. Item two are ancillary funds, item one are pretty much every other DGR. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Pretty uh, clear explanation there. Uh, the last there, one. I there, can I throw? Can yeah. I throw one like little like curly thing? So there are a couple of DGR categories: um, private, public, museums, galleries, and libraries. That are item one and item four, and that item four just enables them to receive gifts through the cultural gifts program. So there is that kind of another another item, item four, but it only applies to the galleries, museums or libraries. I was just thinking that it was too simple. <laughs> okay, the, the last one that we'll do before we let you all go, everyone's yeah, giving up their lunch break to, to spend time with us. So I'm aware of the time and we'll, we'll finish up soon. This one will touch on both charity aspect and tax stuff now. Uh, someone's asked about, actually a few people have asked about, the size of their organisation and a DGR, how big do they need to be? We're not big enough to be a DGR, that sort of thing. So we'll clarify a couple of aspects there. With, um, I'll just touch on the public benevolent institution health promotion charity bit. There's no size requirement as such, but in being eligible for uh, either a public benevolent institution charity or health promotion charity, um, the organisation has to demonstrate that it is an institution. Now, th this is a little bit tricky and can get complex, but um, um, it an institution is more than merely a fund, and um, it, it's an broadly speaking, it's an establishment, an organisation that, that's instituted for the promotion of some object, um, and it is. I suppose the, the shorthand for it is that it, it's more than a fund. So it it has activities, it does stuff. Now, this may be tricky for a new organisation to show that they're an institution, but it can um, help to demonstrate um, through, the charity can help demonstrate that it is an institution through things like, um, you know, business plans and, and strategies and, and things like that in lieu of their, not being uh, an extensive history of having undertaken work. So the short answer to that is there isn't a size requirement in particular for the charity aspect of things, but it does need to, for those two categories I mean, it does need to uh, demonstrate that it is an institution. If you want to have a look more about that aspect of it, uh, again, in the chat there, those two, high, uh, those two links to the fact sheets about 
HBC and PBI go through this in a little bit more detail. Now the size question for um, tax concessions mill, is there a requirement to be endorsed as a DGR? Do you have to be a certain size, I suppose? Um, so a very broadly no, and it's all about your purpose and your activities and how you fit into the description for each of the different different categories that we have. So, yeah, the, the, the basic answer is no. There is only one category where there's a size restriction, and that is the Register of Environmental Organisations. So at the moment, the, what's the, the way the legislation is written, there's a requirement that red, Register of Environmental Organisations, they need to have a minimum of 50 members. So that is the only category where there is some sort of size restriction that actually goes back to your membership. All of the other DGR categories, it, it comes down to your purpose and your activities and do you meet the requirements as have been described in the category. Excellent. Okay, well, I think we're, we're pushing 12.50 now. Well, in some states, <laughs> I'm sure the time is different in depending on where you are in the country. So we're going to um, finish up. There are some resources here that we thought might be useful. If you don't have a pen to drop these down, so right, we're going to send a follow-up email to everyone who registered for the webinar um, later today, uh, I think, if not early tomorrow morning. And that'll have all these links in there. But there's a few important um, resources there that will be useful for this topic, tax concessions, DGR, HBC, PBI, and the, the charity register, of course. ATO resources, Mel. Um, this is where people can find much of the stuff that you've spoken about today if they want to take the time to read through the content there. Yes, and it is, I, I just think the, the not for profit tab on the ATO website kind of has a, a really great menu there and it's divided up into, you know, those getting endorsed. We have information about the DGR tables. We have information about all the tax concessions that we've talked about. Um, and then if you still need to have a chat, you can always give us a call on our phone number. Okay, and that wraps things up for today. Please stay in touch. We've got the, our commissioner, Gary Johns, writes a column um, monthly for our email subscribers. You'll be getting that anyway if you're registered as a charity. We have lots of web guidance, video content, podcasts on the website, and webinars, of course, like this. So look out for the, the upcoming webinars, register for the next one. If you have any questions about your charity and issues in, in its charity, um, the charity aspect of its operations rather than the tax stuff, give us an email at advice at acnc.gov.au and we're pretty active on social media too, those links down there. This webinar has been recorded and will be published at that YouTube channel there, but we'll also include a link to it in the follow-up email that comes out later today or early tomorrow. Thanks for attending. Thank you very much, Mel. We always appreciate you coming on to share your expertise, all things tax, and I'm sure the audience appreciates it too. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for attending and a quick thanks to Chris and Sarah who have been answering all your questions in the background in the live chat. Again, if we didn't get to your question, we will endeavour to give you an answer via email later. So look out for that in the coming day or so. If you have any questions, comments or feedback um, specifically about the webinar, um, send that to education at acnc.gov.au. And as I mentioned at the start, if you get 20 seconds as we close this to do the feedback survey, we'd really appreciate it. We get a lot out of that. Once again, thanks very much, everyone. We hope you enjoy your day. and We hope you got a lot out of this webinar.